According to the Bible, wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Divine wisdom will always provide the solution that is both practical and purely ethical. Welcome to another episode of His Generation Podcast. You're listening to His Generation Podcast, a weekly exploration into biblical truth as we explore the Word of God. His Generation Podcast airs every Sunday morning. So grab your Bible, and here we go. In this episode, we will continue to explore the father's instruction to the young male when it comes to his behavior, uh, especially in the area of looking for a female companion and sexual behavior. So from last week's episode in chapter five, we now transition to chapter six. And what you're going to notice as we get into the instruction of the father to the son, the instruction is no longer merely counsel to the son, where in previous chapter, chapter 5, it says, pay attention to my wisdom. Yet here, the father actually commands his son. In fact, if you look at the verse, it says, my son, keep your father's command and do not forsake the law of your mother. Bind them continually upon your heart and tie them around your neck. Now, you have to notice there the inclusion of the mother's authority, too, and this is especially going to be the most needful ingredient for the topic of one's physical behavior towards the dangers of predatory females. Of course, the father will give his wisdom and will also, ignite like said before, his command in this situation, but the command doesn't come out of just his own thought, but it comes out of the inclusion of the mother's authority, too, there towards the son. And we need to keep that in mind. So it's not the father with just his one-sided opinion or experience, but also, too, the experience of the female's perspective. So this is a combination or an inclusion of both the father and the mother's instruction. Now, notice the next part of these verses here. You have some very practical, practical instruction or the foundation of the instruction. It says there, when you roam, they will lead you. When you sleep, they will keep you. And when you wake, they will talk to you. So you have three outcomes there. And it's lead you, keep you, and talk to you. Now, remember, like I said, these are very practical (laughs) uh, ways of looking at when those things will occur. Because you have this in light of the three scenarios of roaming, sleeping, and awakening. And I go, well, why is that if I look at that text? And what I can conclude is maybe these are the general, natural, broad circumstances in which a young male will likely encounter a woman who's going to entrap him. Because that's the whole purpose of this passage that we're looking at here in Proverbs chapter 6. So we have there that the instruction or the command of the mother and the father, they are purposeful. They're very practical. Like I said before, that divine wisdom will always provide a solution that's going to be both practical and purely ethical. So the idea is that this is the father giving instruction to the son to help him as he goes out in life, pursuing female uh, companionship, Uh, to the point of marriage, which we discovered last week in episode five, but this time also for the warning to prepare him for those that aren't of that same worldview or of that same mindset, where they are looking for companionship for the sake of marriage and to be fulfilled within marriage. These things are outside of that realm. That's the purpose of this. So something to Keep them. And I noticed the last verse there where it says, talk to you, which is a very interesting translation. So it's almost like this. I remember when I used to teach, I used to tell my students, I hope to accomplish after all of this teaching one thing. 
And they would say, well, what is that? And I'd say that my voice would be in your head. So anytime that you're about to engage in some kind of academic endeavor, uh, the things that I taught you foundationally, when you were about to either pursue it with need of encouragement and motivation, or you were about to run into a very common uh, misplaced error, that you would hear my voice in your mind, in your head, and that is what would guide you and lead you. In the same way as this, when it comes to a parental influence in a child's life, we need to hear our parental influence in our mind, especially in this case when it's for the purpose of a disciplinary lifestyle or of a warning when we're about to run into danger. That's the idea behind it. Because look what the next passage is. It says, for the commandment is a lamp and the law a light. The path of life is the correction of discipline to keep you from the evil woman, from the flattering tongue of the seductress. Do not lust after her beauty in your heart, nor let her allure you with her eyelids. What we see here very clearly is this. We see that the practice of wisdom is discipline. In fact, I'll even take it further, which the text says very clearly, the correction of discipline. And that's uh, in the Hebrew, it's tokahat musar. It's this idea of like uh, this continual like need for a disciplinary mindset that that's what you're going to need. So what's interesting, the father's teaching is one with also, it doesn't only come from his opinion, like I said, it is also shared with his spouse's uh, instruction or authority. But ultimately, it comes from the commandments of God. And we need to keep that in mind. Because when we look at this, we have to remember, he's not out of a vacuum saying, oh, just stay away from the seductress. But this comes from the basics of the commandments, the Decalogue, as I've used that term before. And it's commandment number seven, which is do not commit adultery. It's a very basic commandment. But again, this is where the father draws his instruction to give to the son. And until the very act of breaking this commandment is done, you have to assume one thing, that the son has it in his possession. Thus, he must keep and guard it in order not to lose it. That's the idea behind all that we're seeing here. And for him to keep that guard, again, it's an act of discipline. It's a disciplinary lifestyle to keep that guard. And now remember, unethical behavior begins with an internal desire. And the father's instruction will not only bring benefits that are practical for the young man to navigate through life, but they are also a discipline for him to remain righteous behavior before God. Thus, he's using the commandments. You see how that all works? So as, as God gives the commandments and gives authority to the parents, the parents give instruction, wisdom, and warning to the son, and it's based upon the commandments that were first given by God. Thus, the whole family unit is in subject to God, and not just in subject to God in the sense of missing out on the excitement of life, let's just say that. No, but rather protection in a fallen world as they seek to remain righteous in their behavior before God. And that's the bigger picture idea of the actions that the son must endure with discipline as he hears his parents' authority and in in, in voice in his head, and he moves out into life where he roams, where he sleeps, and where he awakes. Those things will keep him. That's the disciplinary lifestyle that this command is commanding, if I can say it that simple. Now, if you go on in the verse, it says there, for by means of a harlot, a man is reduced to a crust of bread, and adulteress will hunt his precious life. And we can't let this part go unnoticed because there's two categories of predatory females and the ultimate outcomes of their entrapment. So you have the prostitute on one hand, and then you have the adulteress on the other hand. The prostitute, according to the poetic way of saying, is reduced to a crest of bread, you can understand that the prostitute will ultimately cause material loss. And I would say even to the point of some kind of desperate poverty. And that's the idea behind the prostitute. 
So the outcomes are, are both bad, but one's worse than the other is what's saying. So neither one of these are right in their pursuit. So you should never pursue someone that's going to seduce you, or nor should you pursue someone that is married and seeks to seduce you. Because with the adulteress, the second predatory female here, understand that the guilty is probably punished by some civic law. In fact, in the Old Testament, according to the Jewish law, if someone was caught in adultery, the adulterer and the female were both stoned to death. So there was a, a civic law that was, was uh, punishable. And then as you get into different societies, you, you do find that uh, some kind of civic law that becomes a uh, punishment of some sort, even in our modern society. Uh, you know, if a marriage is broken because of adultery, usually that weighs in favor for the dividing of the material goods to the person that the adultery was committed against. But not only civic consequences for the adultery, but also, too, there's two other things that are going to be mentioned as we go into this. Because look what it says there. Next verse is it says, Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can, a, can one walk on hot coals and his feet not be seared? So is he who goes into his neighbor's wife. Whoever touches her shall not be innocent. There's the guilt. People do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy himself when he is starving. Yet when he is found, he must restore sevenfold. He may have to give up all of the substance of his house. However, whoever commits adultery with a woman lacks understanding. And he who does so destroys his own soul. Wounds and dishonor he will get, and his reproach will not be wiped away. For jealousy is a husband's fury. Therefore, he will not spare in the day of vengeance. He will accept no recompense, nor will he be appeased through the giving of many gifts. So for the adulteress, when we go back to that idea of like these two separate outcomes of the entrapment, with the adulteress, like I said before, there's civic law that you might be punishable to, but you also have the husband's wrath. And more so, there's an internal destruction of your soul. Because remember, it says back there, whoever commits adultery with a woman lacks understanding. He who does so destroys his own soul. That's pretty harsh. It's a pretty damning way to not only harm yourself, but also harm those involved in the marriage. And of course, last week we talked a lot about how the marriage is so important in an image bearing of God himself. So, we have some instruction for the young man here, and this instruction is very clear. Obviously, the instruction is for the idea of a young man who is about to set off in life looking for his female companion, and with that, it's going to be assumed that there is forms of female predators out there that are looking to entrap that young man and for him not to get involved in those type of relationships. Now, what's interesting in the world today, if we can be a little bit more practical, men desire to get involved in those relationships. Men look for the promiscuous woman or those that maybe have a very low standard of uh, care for others. They even go as far as getting involved in a married woman's life, whether that's a mutual thing or whether that's a seductive thing from the male side. Either way, all these things, the sexual appetites and the seeking to fulfill them is the total opposite of the divine wisdom that is being given here in the Proverbs. In fact, I read a verse in the beginning of this episode that is directly out of James 3, and it talks about some of the attributes of what wisdom is. In fact, it says there in James 3 that wisdom is, is first of all, is from above. In other words, it's more of an internal and a divine quality compared to worldly wisdom, which is more of a earthly or has its time limits. It's not meant for eternity. It's meant for destruction at some point, where divine wisdom is not. It has an eternal aspect to it, and it's pure. It's peaceable. It's gentle. It's willing to yield full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. 
and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So this is divine wisdom and what it looks like. This is the instruction the Father has for the Son. That's the practice that the Son looks to fulfill as he guards these things that, that are his. We're in the opposite, according to James in that same passage, it says this. Worldly wisdom, first of all, is earthly. Like I said before, it has a sense of not containing any kind of eternal value. Secondly, it's sensual, and be, meaning that it's subject to one's unrighteous appetite. And that's what you see when you see people in the world, whether it's male or female. It's the predatory female or the predatory male. It's fulfilling one's appetite, uh, an unrighteous appetite. That's what they're looking to do. That's the wisdom of this world. And then lastly, it's demonic. Or some translations might say devilish. So it's this attribute that, that reflects the actions of an evil spirit or of a demon. <laughs> that's, that's what this earthly wisdom is pretty much summed up as, those three values, earthly, sensual, and demonic. And also that it contains envy and self-seeking. In other words, it's for yourself. It's not considering others. So if someone that gets into an adulterous relationship whether it's the male committing adultery on his wife or the female committing adultery on her husband. Either way, it's self-seeking. It's not thinking of others. It's thinking about one's own personal sensual appetite. And ultimately, when we're talking about outcomes, remember in the very beginning, there's, there's outcomes when it comes to keeping and leading you and talking to you. Well, there's outcomes too when it comes to worldly wisdom. And the outcomes are confusion in every evil thing, according to James. So there's a reason why there's an intensity of the father in Proverbs chapter 6 when he commands his son. And not only does he command his son, but he invokes the authority of both him and the mother, and then ultimately the authority of God's word in the seventh commandment. So that's why there's more of that flavor of command here rather than just simple counsel because we're dealing with a depth of destruction to one's own very way of life and then ultimately destruction to everybody in its path. That's the ideal when it comes to the adulteress. So there's a very severe warning here. I think we should take that into consideration as we look at Proverbs chapter 6. Next week, I'll be looking a little bit at Proverbs chapter 7, and we will conclude on this three-part series when it comes to the instruction of the father to the male son as he goes out into the world to look for companionship. Thank you for joining me on His Generation Podcast. Have a blessed Lord's Day. Thank you for joining us at His Generation Podcast. To receive more information about the podcast, please visit our website, hisgeneration.net, or check out our YouTube channel, His Generation Podcast, for the video format of this broadcast. His Generation is a production of Generation Mars Media, located in Orange County, California.